Talofa Lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susana Suisuki, coming up. It is complicated, there is no trust between the two sides. New Zealand pilot Philip Mertens is still being held hostage by Papuan rebels. Also, we still have increasing numbers of security forces. Kanaki New Caledonia government says there'll be no peace without independence. And, you know, get around the live side at Port Dana and have a bit of fun and, um, you know, join the vibe. Surf's up in Fiji. It's been about a year and a half since New Zealand pilot Philip Mertens was taken hostage by Papuan rebels. All parties, including the hostage takers, have shown a willingness to have him released, but doing so safely in the middle of a decades-long conflict between Indonesian security forces and indigenous militia is proving to be a complex and dangerous task. Caleb Fotheringham has more. In February 2023, Philip Mertens, a husband and father from Christchurch, was working for Indonesian airline Susi Air when he landed his small politis plane on a remote airstrip in Duga Regency in the Papua Highlands. He was taken hostage by a faction of the West Papua Liberation Army, commanded by warlord Igianis Koigoya. The rebels, who also torched his aircraft, later claimed he had breached a no-fly order that they had issued for the area. Sixteen months on, and despite failed attempts to either rescue or secure Mr Merton's release, there's been very little progress. Andrea Sassono, a researcher at Human Rights Watch in Indonesia, says it's a complex situation. It is complicated because there is no trust between the West Papuan militants and the Indonesian military. Mr Hasono says as far as he is aware, Mr Mertens is in all right physical condition, all things considered. Of course, he is not totally okay because he is held hostage, but he is physically okay. He has asthma. I learned that he had his asthma inhaler supplies. The West Papua National Liberation Army High Commander Teriana Sator in a statement in February said they wanted to release Mr Mertens to his family and asked for this to be facilitated by the Secretary General of the United Nations. But Mr Hasono says the entire situation was made more difficult after a failed rescue mission was staged by Indonesian authorities in March last year that saw casualties from both sides. Some Papuan were killed. Meanwhile, on the Indonesian side, more than a dozen Indonesian soldiers, including from the Special Forces, were also killed. It is complicated. There is no trust between the two sides. Marcus Haluk, the Executive Secretary of the United Liberation Movement for West Papua, a political arm of the Free Papua Movement, speaking through a translator, says space for all parties, including the West Papua National Liberation Army, needs to be made to discuss Mr Merton's release. They never involve TPNPB as a part of the conversation. So that's why there is important to create a space and make a decision where we should meet and stakeholders or actors can come together and talk about the process of release. Meanwhile, in a statement sent to RNZ Pacific, a spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade says Mr Merton's safety and well-being remains MFAT's top priority. We're doing everything we can to secure a peaceful resolution and Philip's safe release, including working closely with the Indonesian authorities and deploying New Zealand consular staff. We are also supporting Philip's family both here in New Zealand and in Indonesia. The Indonesian embassy in Wellington has been approached for comment. This week marks one month since violent and deadly clashes erupted in New Caledonia. There's been no clear path put forward by Paris as far as the Kanak Socialist National Liberation Front, or FLNKS, is concerned. In an exclusive interview, the French ambassador to the Pacific, Veronique Roger Lacan, told Lydia Lewis there are options, but the violence needs to stop first. New Caledonia government official Charles Ware says the situation has passed the point of no return. We cannot have the peace without the independence of the country because New Caledonia will be always get into trouble. 
Local journalist Kok Ali Korshon says the leader of a group that organized peaceful protests before the violence broke out has been arrested along with seven others. Something very important is happening right now in Noumea. The policemen went to the headquarters of Union Caledonienne, which is one of the main independentist party, to make a search and Christian T1 one of the main leaders of CC80 has been arrested. And while Paris looks at pointing the finger at CC80, local leaders say the blame rests on France's shoulders. All the trouble since one month now is a result of the ignorance of the French government. The Pacific Conference of Churches General Secretary Reverend James Bagwan says France's heavy deployment of security forces screams militarization. We still have militias who are armed. We still have increasing numbers of security forces on the ground. And that is militarization, whether it is a formal or something that's been organized in a different way. And we're just calling it as we see it. The French ambassador to the Pacific, Veronique Rogelahan, is holding the line. She says the forces are needed and stressed the territory is not militarized. I would like to suggest those people to watch the houses that were burnt, to listen to the people that were harassed in their houses, to listen to people who were really feared the violence and the psychological violence exerted on them. So where to from here? French President Emmanuel Macron has issued a statement saying the controversial constitutional amendments which sparked the unrest are not going to the Congress of Versailles, which was the final hurdle. Veronique Roger-Lacan says the options now are... Independence. The second one is Independence Association, the example of New Way with New Zealand. And uh, the third possibility is within an independent state, which is the one that is on now. Whatever the option, Mr Ware says a robust process that leads to independence is the only way forward. Cloudbreak Fiji has been appointed as the location for the 2025 World Surf League Finals. The iconic wave, located off the island of Tavarua, had its first championship tour competition in 1999. Before the finals next year, the world's best surfers will head to Cloudbreak in August for the last regular stop on the championship tour. In a statement, World Surf League CEO Ryan Crosby said Cloudbreak is one of the best waves in the world and hosting the finals next year is going to be incredible. While Tourism Fiji CEO Brent Hill told Caleb Fotheringham he was stoked. We're really excited about it. Obviously, you know, it took us a few years of working with the WSL to be able to get the Fiji Pro to come back to Fiji. It's been quite a while now since it's actually uh been in fiji uh but then you know the 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 cherry on top was um the announcement that came out today that the the finals are going to be in fiji in 2025 so yeah it's going to be fantastic to have all the guys back um in only a month or so and then and then to have the final next year is a real coup yeah i guess 2017 was the last cloud break event you said you're pretty excited for the one that's coming in a month or so. What preparation has gone in to to get ready for the event? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work, obviously, as you can imagine, behind the scenes to make something like this happen. So what we're working on, obviously, we're getting the tower organised and, and making that a really sustainable solution. So that's that's been done. Um, we've obviously worked with all the, the landowners and the, the villages in Fiji. That's a really important part of the process and, and they've been really well looked after. And um, I've got to hand it to WSL. They've been really respectful of, of that side of things, um, which is great. And, and now we're working on a live site at Port Denarau. So, you know, the key thing that we're saying to people is, you know, whether or not you actually end up seeing any live surf out on the reef, you know, it's still going to be a really exciting time to be in Fiji, you know, get around the live site at Port Denaro and have a bit of fun and, um, you know, join the vibe. Nice. And how big a part does surfing play in the tourism sector in Fiji? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, growing. I mean, you, you talk to Fiji Airways and they'll tell you how many boards are coming in on the planes. It's certainly 
you know, matching and, and probably even moved past golf, which is really great. And I think from that perspective, um, you know, it, it's such a world-class venue here. You know, you can stay on the mainland, you can stay at places like Marriott or Sofitel or Hilton and easily get a boat out there. You don't have to be out on the islands. It's really accessible. And I think, you know, until I moved to Fiji, I didn't realise just how accessible it was. So it's, yeah, it's really, really special to see. It's a really growing part of our our tourism. And, and the good thing is it's a really respectful one. Everyone understands that, you know, the villages need to be compensated and that's that's happening as well. Do these sort of events, I guess, having the, the best of the best come in surf cloud break, does that encourage a bit of local participation in surfing itself? Have you noticed, I guess, popularity of surfing increasing in Fiji? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. So the great thing is we get a... Um, uh, a wildcard entry for both men and, and women. So that's really exciting. We've got a couple of guys that are local charges that get out there and, and, um, and really rip it. So, you know, we're hoping that they can, they can do really well. And, you know, personally, from my perspective, I've got a bit of a goal where, you know, Fiji obviously won our first Olympic medal with rugby sevens, but really outside of rugby sevens, you know, it falls away pretty quickly in terms of our participation. But now that surfing is an Olympic sport, it's a really aspirational and believable goal that maybe we can get a Fijian into the Olympics representing Fiji in surfing and, and, and get good enough to get, you know, get up there and get on the tour and, and, and maybe even get a medal. So, you know, that's a really exciting thing. Um, we're certainly seeing more, you know, young grommets come through who are getting out there, which, which is really good to see. You know, surfing's a really accessible sport for a lot of people. So, you know, that, that's certainly exciting that there's a real legacy component to this as well. Great. Well, well, you definitely have the waves for for that growing popularity and and to produce the talent to compete on the big stage. In terms of the wave cloud break itself, Brent, can you describe it to me? What what does it look like? Well, I've been out there, and I can guarantee you this: if you are like you want to be a good surfer, that's for sure. Like it's not a wave that uh, you mess around on. It's not a wave that I go on. But the good thing in Fiji, you know, we do have waves for every ability, which is great. I've, I've actually learned to do stand-up surfing over here on much easier waves. But, yeah, crowd break is just this big pumping left-hander. It sort of comes in from deep out in the ocean, so there's a lot of water, a lot of power behind it. It's, it's something else to see it when it's really going. So, you know, certainly from that perspective, we're going to put as many boats as we can in the water so people can see it live. But even seeing it on TV, it's a it, it's a beautiful wave, and and you know to hear the uh, the pros talking about it being their favourite wave in the world, it's just something that Fiji has to capitalise on. That we've got something that that everybody loves in that space. So it's really exciting. It's a really consistent wave, and of course it's um you know so beautiful out there. So so I think from that perspective, we just can't wait to see those images of Fiji going around the world. Miss Pacific Islands, Moimuana Shwinki, has renewed calls for large carbon emitting countries to take accountability for the everyday reality of climate impacts in the region. She gave seminar talks to people on the topic of climate change and performed a traditional tawalunga or finale dance with her Samoa delegation at FESPAC. Tiana Haxton spoke with Miss Pacific Islands in Hawaii on the sidelines of the festival. FESPAC is amazing. I've been enjoying it so much. It's a celebration, a unification of our Pacific family. It's also a time that we can come together and remind each other of the, the gifts that we've been handed down and what we need to preserve. And I think as we're looking into the past and celebrating that, we're also thinking about the future and there's a lot of amazing discourse that's taking out um, to remind our young people what they need to step up into and continue advocating. And I know you did some uh, seminars as well and spoke to the, the white yell youth that are here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what's been your message to young ones who are here to yes. learn more about their culture, showcase their culture and be, be leaders in their communities? Thank you. Um, my main message in the panels that I've taken on and also to the youth that I've been able to speak to is I I know that we often look externally for answers or for inspiration or for leadership, but my reminder was that the leadership, inspiration and answers are often within our own homes and in our own regions. 
my main message is to continue to tell our young people to tell their own stories, that they have so much worth in their lived realities, that they need to look at what they're doing in their lives and see it as treasure and see it as something worth sharing with the world. I'm a very passionate dancer and storyteller, therefore that's how I best represent myself and I've just been urging a lot of the youth to continue to um, seek what they are passionate about and what their purpose is, use their gifts and talents to serve the community. Service is so fundamental in all of our Pacific cultures um, and if we can keep serving the communities we're a part of, we can make influence positive change, um, not only in our countries, but in our whole region. And my last question, I know you've been very vocal with your climate messages as well while you're here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, yeah, climate change is the single greatest threat facing our Pacific region. And it's so important that we understand the cause of climate change. Um, we are the least responsible, but we're affected the most and it's affecting our homes every day in terms of sea level rise, extreme weather patterns. In Samoa, in the Pacific, it's getting hotter. Um, you know, there's exacerbated natural disasters. And these are all things that we see happening um, more frequent and more severely. And it's definitely something that we need to all be aware of. Um, it's our bigger countries, more powerful nations that are the root cause of why we are experiencing um, the negative effects to the earth and I think the Pacific provides solutions and answers because our philosophy and way of treating the environment has always been harmonious and um, I think the rest of the world can look to that. That's Pacific Waves for today. To listen back, head over to rnz.co.nz forward slash Pacific. We're also on Spotify, Airport and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, to far sweet four.